All right, so what I introduced in the last video without saying so was the concept of the binary opposition. Uh, Fausto Sterling tends to call it the, a dualism, um, but a lot of the times in the literature, literature you'll hear the term binary opposition. So the term binary came from computer language. In computer language, everything is either off or on, either or, right? So uh, the term binary opposition means that something's either off or on. Something's either male or female. It's either gay or straight. It's uh, either man or woman. Um, binary oppositions have this, be have this characteristic to them, and the characteristic is that they're mutually exclusive. In other words, in, most, um, in the most fundamental Western thought, a man can't be a woman and a woman can't be a man. They've got to stay apart. They're, they're very separate things. And so. Um, the the most the, I guess the most defining quality of the binary opposition is that they're mutually exclusive. A second quality of the binary opposition is that they tend to be dialectical, right? Um, dialectic. Dialectic is hard. <laughs> um, it there's it depends on how much you've already read about this concept of dialectic to to know how much how deep you can take the understanding of it. But at a very basic basic level. Uh, a dialectic means sort of a competition between two things. Um, the best example that uh, people usually come up with is the way that we organized, organize our research papers. So usually when you have a research paper, you have a thesis, right? And that's the thing that you're positing, the, the goal that you're setting for yourself, what you want to say at the end of your paper, what you want to prove, um, that's your thesis. And then the, the counter to that, or the, the dialectical opposition, or the binary opposition to that, is the counter argument, the antithesis. You've got the thesis and the antithesis, right? Um, and then when you, when you take those two as a pair, and you put them together, and you make sense of what, what does that mean? If you've got this thing that's true, and this thing that, that contradicts its truth, when you put them together, what's, what's the end result? That term is a synthesis. So you synthesize the thesis with the, the antithesis to make a synthesis. hope that makes sense. So that's sort of the stereotypical dialectic. When you've got one thing, you've got a thing against it, and you're trying to put those two things together to form uh, a synthesis of those two things. Well, with most binary oppositions, gender and sex, um, male and female, for example, we've been trying for years to make sense of how those two things work together and we still don't know. I mean, people are still guessing whether w women are from Mars and men are from Venus or whatever, right? So there seems to have been this ongoing motion where women and men are trying to make sense of each other and come to some sort of understanding, some sort of synthesis. So you can definitely see how uh, that binary opposition, male and female, are in dialectic or in a dialectical relationship with one another. They're mutually exclusive up until very recent modern times with intersexuals and stuff that we'll discuss in, in a second part of our reading for today. But um, for the most part, we're seeing this that the idea is built into our head that no matter what our bodies are telling us, in our minds, we're two separate things and never the twain shall meet. So that's important to understand as we go and in, move into this next part of uh, Fausto Sterling's argument. And as she says, her, her own thesis is on page five. It starts under that, that um, divider called real or constructed. And she says about the fourth line down, the central tenet of this book is that truths about human sexuality created by scholars in general and by biologists in particular are one component of political, social, and moral struggles about our cultures and economies. At the same time, components of our political, social, and moral struggles become quite literally embodied, incorporated into our very physiological being, right? My intent is to show how these mutually dependent, not mutually exclusive, but mutually dependent claims work, in part by addressing it, such issues as how, through their daily lives, experiments, and medical practices, scientists create truths about sexuality, how our bodies incorporate and confirm these truths, and how these truths, sculpted by the social, social milieu in which biologists practice their trade, in turn refashion our cultural environment. So that's a hefty goal that she sets out for herself in that little tiny paragraph there. What she's basically saying is the binary opposition of nature and nurture, nature being what is actually inside of our bodies when we are birthed, when we come out absolutely unscripted, we don't know anything, we have no real information, and we start to gather information just like that. That's nature. What are we when we are intrinsically and innately born without any sort of environmental pressure or suggestion? 
Nurture is the exact opposite. What does culture turn us into? What does the, the process of acculturation or the process of socialization create us to be? What kind of beings do we become once the nature part of us interacts with that social part? So again, we're seeing that dualism. What happens when nature and nurture synthesize? What does that dialectic relationship produce, right? And what she hopes to show, just like what she said about all the other dialectics that we've been talking about, is that it's not that simple, stupid. You've got to think of these things as interdependent rather than mutually exclusive. What is the word that she uses? Mutually dependent rather than mutually exclusive. So nature and nurture aren't things that you can just pull apart like that and hope to separate because they inform one another and are intrinsically linked. You can't remove the body from culture because you're using culture to talk about it. And you can't remove culture from the body because the body is necessary to talk about culture, the brain, the materiality. And she uses that word quite a bit. She's talking about the actual physical substance of ourselves when she uses that word materiality. That's the actual nature that she's talking about. What is going on in our flesh, in our bones, in our brain cells, the actual tangible things. What's taking place inside of our bodies is what nature, what she means by nature. And so if you could really imagine a world, just for a moment, free your mind to imagine a world where these dialectics didn't really exist and no one was asking you to fit into any sort of um, role. They didn't want you to play a race. You didn't have to act black or act white or act Asian. You could just act. Hopefully, um, what, what the hope would be is that if people were released from these pressures, they would they would perform what was kind of more natural to them, right? What came to the surface without any type of uh, social conditioning. So if you can imagine a world like that, what might you do? What might two people do together if that world existed? If they didn't have any of these um, institutions bearing down on them saying, don't do this, don't do this, this is wrong, this is amoral, this is sinful. If you didn't have any of that socialization, what would your body do? How would your body act? And so when you start to think about it in those terms, you start to see the difference between these, these two bodies that she keeps talking about. And yes, she's talking about two different things. The one body is the actual physical body without any acculturation, without any socializa so socialization. The second body that she's talking about is a body that fits right into culture, a body that's been cultured, a body that's been um, thought about in terms of culture. And so um, that again is a dueling dualism, nature, the natural body or the nurtured body, the sort of physical body or innate body or the socialized conditioned body. And you'll see her making that distinction several times over when the truth of the matter is, and she says this, the truth of the matter is you can't separate those any more than you can separate straight and gay. Everything exists on a continuum, and that is an argument that she'll make throughout this book. Everything exists on a continuum. You can't always fill one of these specific roles because they're too simple for complex individuals to do. You've got, you, as a human, you naturally tend toward filling multiple roles and toward be, um, embracing multiple identities. There's no constant, or uh, there's no identity constancy, and that's a term I'm going to bring up in the next video. So as you're going through this book, you've got to keep in mind all of these dueling dualisms that she's talking about and the way that she's using the categories themselves of um, nature and nurture to, to talk to us about these two different, dis like these two distinct ideas of the body. But in reality, you can never separate those two things because you have to use the one body to think about the other body. So I'm hoping some of that, um, some of what I'm kind of rambling about here helps you make sense of some of the ways that she's breaking down the body uh, the social body as a constructed body and the natural body as a born body. Um, and if that doesn't make sense, we can chat it out a little bit on the discussion or on the wall this week. So I'm running out of time again. In the next video, I'm going to introduce to you the themes that I've sort of selected for you uh, and then we can negotiate other themes if you'd like. So stay tuned. One more video.